Hey everyone, this is Tracy Friedlander. You're listening to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. On the show today, I have pianist and composer Sharon Rookman. When I heard Sharon's story, I knew I had to invite her on the podcast to share it with us. First of all, Sharon is unique that she is really getting her career jump started now at the age of 71, which I think is so inspiring. Not only did she really start creating in the last 10 years or so, but she has a very interesting family story that kickstarted the whole process. Today, you'll hear the story about her great uncle Rudy and how bits and pieces of his story kept resurfacing until she finally decided to go down the rabbit hole and get the entire story. Not only was the story incredible, discovering this story actually freed her up creatively so she could finally create her dream music career. Today, Sharon tells the story of uncovering her Uncle Rudy's story and what happened because of it. Out of this project came a new freedom in her own music career and a compelling memoir, a book about the whole experience called The Gift of Rudy, which you can find on Amazon. I'll include the link in the show notes. But before we get started, I want to let you know about a couple of quick things. Do you run your own music studio? If so, I want you to know about my new free report, Get More Students, Attract Top Quality Students That Are a Joy to Work With and Pay You Top Dollar. People are already emailing me after reading it and saying it really gets them thinking in new ways about what's possible in their teaching businesses. This report will show you how you can make more money, have more time, find your ideal student, and actually build a studio you love. The link to download the report is in the show notes. And by the way, this report is for you whether you already have a full studio or you're starting from scratch, whether you're teaching lessons on your instrument or you're looking to attract students or clients to offer them something different in your area of expertise. In addition to that, I also want to let you know about a really cool payment and scheduling platform called Fonz. Fonz is a company co-founded by guitarist Eric Branner, who is actually a guest on Crushing Classical, which streamlines the whole business and admin side of lessons. From scheduling to payments to integrating Zoom like everyone is doing now, Fonz takes care of it all. When you use Fonz, scheduling becomes a breeze, students get email reminders, and they always know the Zoom link. And no more chasing after payments. Everything comes through on one platform and results in a direct deposit to you. Fonz usually gives you a 15-day free trial, but if you'd like to try Fonz for free for an additional 30 days, use the link in the show notes, which is fonz.com slash join slash at Tracy G. Friedlander. You'll find that link in the show notes. Let's get started. Well, welcome to the show. Welcome to Crushing Thank Classical, you. Sharon. I'm thrilled to be here. I really am, oh, especially nice. because I love the title, Crushing Classical, because it's so appropriate, I think, for what's going on now in music. I think so, too. I totally agree with you. And it's it's an interesting time. So I really appreciate your point of view, because, you know, you had such an interesting career as somebody who's really revived it much later in your life. You know, I think yes. you had, you, you, you told me before that you, you know, and we're going to get all this story out, but um, that you, you studied and you were a serious student, yes. but that really the best part of your career has happened much, much later in your life. Yes. So, so let me hear some of that story. Like, how did you, maybe tell us what you do now and then we'll work backwards. How's that? Okay. Whatever works for you. Okay. Uh, I would say 10 years ago is when I started to really become serious about composing, even though I always love to compose, but that's a whole nother story because I couldn't access it for many reasons. But uh, one day my cello teacher who I studied with at the time said to me, why don't you write a cello duet? And I thought, Okay, and so within a very short time, I wrote a cello duet, and that opened up everything for me, because all of a sudden I realized that I had this well of material inside that I always wanted to get out, and before I knew it, in five years, I had uh, basically uh, completed five CDs of chamber music, and it was just amazing to me because I couldn't stop writing. 
And at that particular time, I also had heard about my great uncle who was very, even though I never met him and he had died at a very young age at 25, my father used to tell me about him and said, you know, Rudy used to love certain types of music to play. And I decided to, in his memory, write some violin pieces, which were also part of the CDs. Okay, so and this is like, you just decided, you know, since you have this great uncle, um, you were thinking back to what your father had told you and you just yes. thought like, why not? It's an inspiration for what I'm doing now. Right. And is that sort of how the kind of nut got cracked open as far as like getting to know more about this great uncle? Because I think this is what's so cool. We're going to dive into the story a lot more about like, who is this mystery person that you had <laughs> in your life right. and how he had such a big impact on you kind of post-mortem because he, he was go long gone before you were even born, right? Long gone. Yes, yeah. long gone. Yes. And what happened was when I started to write this music, I felt that it would be a special uh, dedication to him okay. in a way, because even though I never met him, I knew about him growing up. And I thought, while I'm composing, let me write some violin pieces. Okay, so tell us fun. a little bit about him. He, he was a violin, you knew he was a violinist, right? Yes, he was a virtuoso actually, considered one of the great violinists of his generation at the time, even though he was only 25 years old. Okay, what was his, what was his full name? His name was Rudolf Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S. Okay. And he began to perform in New York. Uh, he debuted in Steinway Hall. And uh, he also performed all over New York City. He, had a, he was a part of a quartet, but he also performed as a soloist and then eventually moved out to LA. But uh, I met some of the players that he played with in his quartet, especially one who was a violist and who lived in Brooklyn at the time. And I was about 10 years old. And as over the years, I got to know him much more about him, uh -huh. but it really was even before I started to write and compose my CDs, it was probably about 25, 26 years ago when I first received his first stack of sheet music from a relative. And those were, that was music that he played on his violin. And uh, he used many of those pieces in his recitals. Okay. And over the years, all of this was actually going on at the same time, but over the years, my father handed me letters between my grandfather and Rudy. Uh, I also received documents, photos from different relatives, uh, recital programs. And then what happened was after I finished my CDs five, 10 years ago, I started my own research because I felt I need to know more about this man. I right. felt such a great spiritual connection to him. I felt I, there was something about this that I that needed to be told. I needed to, right. I, I needed to know. Yeah, so, and so and so like were people just giving that to you over the years because they were like, oh, Sharon's the musician. Uh, she'll want to see this or whatever. Was it sort of like that? Right, or, I mean, like why well, were they handing you the stuff all the time? Like over right, the years. Yes, I think what happened was the sheet music, they knew I was musician yeah. and the relative dropped off. But after that, it was something else. I began to learn more about Rudy and his relatives. And I started to connect with them. And one particular relative, which was Rudy's brother's son, who's still living, he's about 87 years old now. He had all of Rudy's documents. His father was also a violinist, not as good as Rudy, but he was Rudy's older brother. And he saved all of Rudy's things. And so somehow or another, when I began to write a book about Rudy, which I did about, about a, two years ago, I had all this information. But what happened was I did three years of research myself because I wanted to know much as much as I could now with internet, I thought there's so much more I could know about him. And when I stopped the research is when things started to really happen because that was when, even though I'd written many blogs about him on my website, there was a young woman who contacted me and told me with photos, by the way, one photo showing a chin rest of his with his name etched in it, 1920, and another 
with a photo of an original certificate that was in the viola case. Now he just played the viola when he started out, but then became a violinist. But this viola case, original viola case, had an original receipt in it from 1920, 23, when he purchased the viola. And I, when I found out, I said, I need to get this viola. So that's when not only did I receive the viola, but decided to take it to a luthier and restore it, but to also take lessons because I felt that I, this gift came to me, I need to take lessons. Mm -hmm. So all of this was happening at the same time, along with me writing a book about this great man. And I had all the information I needed because of the relatives. And then a year later came another surprise, major surprise. I had never heard Rudy play with all that I knew about him. There was no recording available. And this man who was a record collector contacted me out of nowhere and said, Sharon, I wanna tell you that I found a recording of your great uncle's 1929. And this is one of his two recordings and I'm gonna send you a copy. And I eventually purchased the original record, record of, because he had sold it to me. And I thought, there's a message here. There is a major message. This man is somehow connecting with me and saying, Sharon, you need to think about your music. You need to create, you need to do something that is going to, it's your second chance. It's your, your time to really feel empowered and to just go for it. And I have. And, and so I, how old, like, can you, <laughs> Do you mind sharing your age and sure. how old were you when when uh, when this was happening? Yeah, so uh, when all of this was happening with Rudy, when I got the viola, it was probably about five or six years ago. Uh -huh. uh, and then after that. And how old were you? So I was at that time probably 66 years old. Okay. So at that time, when I did receive it, I began lessons right away and after that, I had this, again, more creative juice, this well of stuff that I had sitting and I was writing viola duets. And then what happened was I began to, uh, I, was, I opened myself up to different ideas with uh, writing different styles of music. And before it was always classical, but now I felt, let me use what I have I've been surrounded by all styles of music. And before I knew it, I was fusing classical with jazz and classical with Latin and classical with blues. And I don't know what happened to me. I didn't even recognize myself. I said, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> and uh, then I formed a group. I formed a group of, right before COVID, but with a percussionist, a violist, a cellist, a saxophone player and a flutist and me. And I was creating different pieces with different varieties of instrumentation. Cause I thought, you know what? I've always rebelled against feeling boxed into a genre. It's yeah. now about doing something completely different, opening myself up to wherever this takes me and uh, just using, experimenting with different styles of music and experimenting with different instrumentation, different combinations of instruments, especially because I had all these instrumentalists around. And so that's really what happened to me. It just, it was an explosion of something. <laughs> that's what happened. That's amazing. That's so, you know, tell us a little bit more about Rudy because, yes. you know, I know his life was very interesting, especially how what he was doing at the end there, you know, because that that part of the story I was really blown away by. So yeah, share yeah. us, share with right. us like what was what was happening in his world, what was going on? Like right. he was right. really a rising star. So he was a rising star. So as I said, he debuted in Steinway Hall and he also played at some of the big venues in New York City at the time. At that point, many years later he decided to move on to LA and he was a concert master, one of the big radio stations. Uh -huh. I think he even moonlighted sometimes with Paul White, with Whiteman, 
who had a jazz band and he did a lot of moonlighting in LA uh, with a lot of bands, orchestras, and that's how he earned his living. Um, and so he was very involved in that. And what happened was uh, during Passover, he decided to go back to his family because he grew up in Brooklyn. That's where his family was. He had five brothers and a sister, big family. And he decided to spend some time there. And he drove, he bought a car and he drove back to New York. And when he was there, he got a telegram from his teacher, also the man that he played with, Albert Vershawn, who was a very fine violinist and also was the uh, main violinist in his quartet. And Albert said to him, Rudy, please come back to LA because we have some gigs for you. You need to get back. So Rudy's father said, you know what? It's a long drive back. Don't bother driving. Uh, why don't you take the train back? So at that time, it was 1933 at the Chicago World's Fair. And the World Chicago World's Fair was a fascination for most people. I actually went online to look at all the exhibits and it looked amazing, really did. Uh, uh, almost futuristic at the time. And so Rudy decided to get on a train. He had some time before he had to get back on his train to go to LA. And he checked his violin, which was a very fine 17, I think 87, Joseph Galliano violin. He checked it in in the locker, which surprised me because he never left that violin. It was always almost attached to him and decided the last minute to go up in a sightseeing plane so he could get a great view of the Chicago World's Fair. So he goes in this plane, I think there were maybe eight or nine people all together on the plane. And you know, Chicago is very windy and it hit wind and it was a seaplane, a Sikorsky seaplane. It went up and down for a while and then it hit wind again. And I think the pilot lost control and basically it went up in flames. And he was 25 at the time. And he was just this brilliant, bright star, shining star uh, of, you know, who had such an incredible career ahead of him. Uh, and so I never got over that story. It just touched me in such a way that even though I never met him, I always felt something very deep, uh, that connection toward him because he was the only serious musician in the family. And I, I always felt that I was, uh, I felt a void. I felt that I was cheated out of meeting this man. Yeah. That's the way I felt. Yeah. And I know we talked about this on our previous and, call and I was like, <laughs> did you ever talk to a, like, psychic? Any, yes. Like a psychic <laughs> or any of those? Yeah. So I what happened? What happened? Yeah. That? So I spoke to a number of them actually, because I thought, you know what? I'm in this story now all the way. I'm going to find yeah. out more about this. So even though I had never been to a psychic before, there were a couple of very good ones, recommended ones around my area. And believe it or not, each of them had something to share. Although one of the women was quite extraordinary because I was only with her for an hour once at one visit. And she said to me that she, she said, Rudy had another name, didn't he? And I did because he had a stage name, which was Rudolph Fox. And she said, he always wears white shirts. And I said, he does. And she actually felt him being in the plane. She said she felt claustrophobic, that she felt she was between air and water, which I found quite extraordinary. She didn't know because much she about- didn't know, She didn't know she, how he died. She didn't know the story at all. I mean, this is this was her. She just felt something, and she told me that she even. I think she may have mentioned a violin or some instrument, but we really didn't get into that much. She did say to me, however, that I there was a deep connection between me and Queens, New York, and I said, "Really? I mean, I have a family who's buried there, but um, I said, really, I don't, I don't know what that is." And then she said, "I want you to think about this because there is." A connection. And then I realized after that's where Rudy was buried in Queens. And actually, I went to the cemetery because I felt as part of the story, I needed to know everything about him. So I actually went to the cemetery a few times just to just to go there. 
Yeah. And so how did they get his violin back and everything like that? Right. So I, I, I actually don't know the details of my grandfather was called because my grandfather was close to Rudy and he was called to go to Chicago. And basically you couldn't really identify the body except for things because it was, it was, there was a fire, but he did, he was told, I think they found a ticket somewhere. So he was able to recover the violin in the locker and he brought it back with him. And then my, uh, actually Rudy's, I told you Rudy's brother's son, who I'm in touch with my second cousin who lives in New York, he actually has Rudy's ring. And he's actually shared the violin certificate, the purchase that Rudy made of the violin. I've traced the violins. One is actually with the concert master at the Hong Kong Symphony. And I was, I, I basically just said, I'm doing it all. I need to know everything I can possibly yeah. know. Yeah. That's so incredible. And now you have a book, right? And you, I you have a book. book. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I'll make that you can buy it on Amazon. What's it, what's it called? It's called the gift of Rudy, the okay. gift of Rudy. Yeah. Are you D Y? I will make sure that's in the show notes. Cause that story <laughs> That's so incredible, actually. I know, and I wrote a piece, by the way, called Another Time, which was reminiscent of that time that he lived. And I ended up uh, writing it for the viola. So for the viola and piano, because I'm a pianist. And my teacher played the viola part on Rudy's viola. And so uh, that's part of the book. Anyway. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's fantastic. And so... So really the, the research around Rudy pushed you towards, towards your music career again and reviving it, it in your, it in your seventies or in your it late sixties. It did That's because my motto is, career. yeah, my motto is it's never too late. We don't, we can't control uh, what happens to us in our lives or when it happens, but we certainly, if the t opportunity arises, we should take advantage of it because it doesn't matter what age you are. It's about doing something that touches you, something that engages you. And it really doesn't matter what the age is uh, because I feel that actually this is the best time to be doing this because now there are opportunities to be online, to be on playlists, to you know, get your music out, which there wasn't even 20 years ago. So right. it's a good time. It's a good time. Exactly. So tell us a little more about, um, you know, I know that you had said that you took a break in your career. So what was, what was happening? Like take us back in the past to like, you had, you were a music student. Um, tell us a little bit about your training yes. and what happened and why you didn't initially go into music like right yes. away. Yes. So I was from the time I was five and I'll start with that because I always wrote little melodies. I was fascinated with melodies. And I had a piano and I used to, you know, pluck around, play around on the keys. Uh -huh. And then I actually wrote my first piece, I think when I was six years old, I still have it. Uh, because as I said, I was fascinated with, with melodies. And when I was eight, I began piano lessons. And unfortunately, uh, I had first a, a great piano teacher, but then I moved to Long Island and I had a teacher who taught at Juilliard and she was very hard on me. Uh, she even kicked me out of my lessons because she told me I wasn't prepared. And I think part of the problem was that no one recognized at the time was I had ADHD and no one knew that and I couldn't sit still. And of course that uh, impeded my progress with trying to progress with my, my piano and some right. of my other studies. And nobody knew what that was. I mean, nobody talked didn't. about that back then, right? I mean, it's, no, right. they didn't know about it. So I was blamed for it because I was looked upon as somebody who was lazy, which wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. But I did also take voice lessons a little older on, but so I was taking piano voice and there were great expectations of me to perform and because the teachers told me that I was talented and they expected a lot of me. And because of that, it put a lot of pressure on me. And I felt that uh, almost a little, um, what's the word for, sometimes I'd hide it in my closet because I just felt overwhelmed by the whole thing. And it turned me off 
to performing actually made me very almost uh, frightened about performing because I was feeling very insecure about myself. Uh, and I don't think my parents realized what they were doing, but between my teachers and my parents, there were too many pressures and I didn't perform well. So I continued on. And even with all of that being said, I still was able to get into some amazing summer programs. I was part of the Blossom Music Festival uh, and there I sang uh, in a chamber choir under Robert Shaw, who was a famous conductor at the time. Oh, yeah. And I also was in a chorus uh, that Leonard Bernstein conducted of the Mahler Second. And I had some amazing experiences. I even was part of all state and all county and, and all, uh, what else did I say, all, and all Eastern. And it was, it was fabulous. So I was fortunate that I was able, even with the fact that I couldn't practice that much and do what I needed to do, um, I was still able to be part of these programs. Right. And then what happened was I decided to go into teaching, although that was something my parents guided me to do. And I taught for a while, but I wasn't that crazy about it. Uh, it was tough teaching in public schools. I was an itinerant. I moved around a lot. Uh, teach The kids weren't very well behaved. And I was in West Haven, Connecticut. And it was hard. So uh, even though, and then I had a family and I think what happens with that, I was obviously that was my priority, but I still perform locally. I still push myself to do that. Even though I had discomfort sometimes with that. Um, but the thing that was always gnawing at me was the writing. I always wanted to write and I just couldn't get to it because I couldn't sit still long enough. And because of the ADD and because of some of the dysfunctionality in my family, it was such a hamper to me that I just couldn't access this stuff. And it made me very sad. I felt a great void inside. And then as I got older, uh, I just found out more about ADHD and I took something to help me with that. I was in my, actually I was about in my early 60s or late 50s when I started to take medication for the ADHD. And I went from sitting still from a half an hour, 20 minutes to 10 hours a day. Wow. And I was writing like crazy. And that's when all of this started opening up for me because I realized what was inside that I could never produce. And I think that was, that was the key for me. Uh, also at that point, I had therapy over the years and I resolved things with my family and worked through that. So I healed from a lot of these things. And that was now gave me an opening to really do something that I wanted. I had to let go of all that other stuff. I even went back to my childhood places to just put the past behind me. And I went back to my old piano teacher who was 86 at the time. I, not, I, I made an appointment to see her and she lived in the same apartment with the same piano, the really? same furnishings. And she said, she remembered me. I went to visit her and I needed to let go of that. I did all of that just so that I could move on with my life. Wow. So you really had to go and forgive her. I did, I did. I did, but I think it was important that she was still living, that I could see her and just do it, make the last visit and then just go on. And I did that with my childhood places. I went back, to, I carted my husband around and I went back to all my childhood places and I did it. And I, then I felt this great relief. Mm -hmm. And I felt that now I could clear my head to write because in order to write, you can't have anything obstructing, nothing in the way. You just have to concentrate on your writing. Nothing else can come between you and that. So that's, that's what I so did. That's so powerful. So was it, your, was it your idea to just go and, and do all those things? Or did anyone yes. say like, maybe you really need to do that or you just thought of it? I'll tell you what happened. This is crazy. I went into my closet one day in my music room and I saw a piece of jewelry that my mother gave me because my mother and I had, I had real problems with my mother, but that's a, that's a story. In any event, in any event, I look at this piece of jewelry and I said, 
this is not nice to me. I don't like it. I'm getting rid of it, okay? So then I proceeded to get all of the VHSs at the time, all of the videos that we did of the family and so forth. I said, I'm taking them out of the closet. I want to look at them and really view and understand what has happened in my family. And boy, was that telling. Wow. <laughs> And I did all of that and I disposed of things that didn't work for me anymore. And I converted all of those over to, you know, DVDs and CDs, all of those old VHSs. And yeah. I learned a lot more about my family from looking at that because those don't lie. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at it and I said, okay, now I'm ready to take the next step. And I realized that I needed to just really clean the slate. That's what I needed to do. So my thought was the next thing is going back to my childhood places, just putting that behind me and being ready to really change my life. That's what that was. That's amazing. And you know, I've done, I've done some kind of personal development work and some of that is called with, in where I was doing, they call it becoming complete with something like oh. it's complete. It's in the past. It's over. It's done. And so that's really what you did. And it sounds like you just systematically went through everything you weren't complete about, but mm. you took some kind of action that would allow you to become complete and it cleared the cleared your mind to move forward. Right. I mean, it was, it was something that just came from me. For some reason, I felt it was the next step. I yeah. can't even explain it. It just felt right. And I said, this is something I have to do. And it just changed everything for me. Because I, even though my parents at the time were still living, they were, uh, my, both my parents were about 95 years old. Uh, my mother just died last year, but my father had died about three or four years ago. He actually knew about Rudy's The Viola coming to me. So we had an opportunity briefly to actually have some sort of a better situation, better relationship, the two of us. That's what brought us a little more together. Uh, and it was that Viola that he was astounded that something like that could happen. But my parents were around. I didn't go through this with them, uh -huh. but it was something I needed to do for me. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, acceptance of a lot of things. That's what it is, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's so powerful. Yeah. And then look, look what you, what you're creating now. It's yeah. so, it's so phenomenal. So yeah. what, um, I know you have your CD. Can you share a little more about like, yes. what's available if people, you know, if there are people, there's probably people listening who might want, you know, write something for them or maybe yeah. get some of your music that's already written. Can people buy the sheet music? Like, right. tell us more right. about, about that. Right. right. So uh, what happened was, uh, there's a lot going on, but that <laughs> 10 years ago, as I said, I wrote a lot of CDs. These are all up on CD Baby, Spotify. If you go to my, either on CD Baby or if you go to my website, SharonRuckman.com, R-U-C-H-M-A-N, Okay. I have everything up there. I even have videos I created with some tango dancers. And I wrote a lot of tango music because I've been to Buenos Aires several times. And I also took tango lessons. And I was so captivated by tango music. So uh, these dancers are actually dancing to my, to my music. And so I have videos up on that. But I also created recently a couple of things. Uh, viola duets. I'm selling viola duets because I felt that there was, I would say, a dearth of viola music, viola duet music, that I felt I needed to jazz up a little bit. So it's all been the old classical stuff. But in my viola duets now, I have uh, dances, I have waltzes, I have tango stuff, I have malangas, I have even blues pieces. I have, you know, habaneras, uh, things that are impressionistic. It's just all over the place. And um, I think it's exciting because I don't think there's much of that out there. Right. So I, I have that, but I also have my new album, which is called Simply Sonoro, S-O-N-O-R-O. -O. And Simply Sonoro, Sonoro is my group now, my, my ensemble. And so what I've done is I have pieces there 
and it's all, I think, on the website, but also it's on SoundCloud and it's on CD Baby. And so I've, to give you an example, I have something, I have Latin stuff. I also have something called Bach and Rock, which is Bach music combined with some rock beats. And that's what I did. Then I also have, and a lot of this is now on playlists because I've been getting on a lot of playlists. So, and then I you have- on Spotify? On Spotify. on Spotify, yes. Uh -huh. We've been doing the Submit Hub and I'm getting a lot of my music on playlists. Uh, but it's a, it, there's a, and then I have a blues piece uh, that I normally, you wouldn't do a blues piece with uh, say flute, cello and piano, but that's what I have. And okay. it's, it's a really, they're all interesting combinations of things. Um, so anyway, that's what it's called. And so I'm actually working on the next, the next album because I'm, I can't stop writing. I'm just uh, going a little crazy. You're a uh, every, <laughs> yeah, every, day, every day I sit down, every day I, I write. I'm, I'm so uh, invigorated, so excited about this because I love creating. I can't wait to get up in the morning and just sit down and do something. I feel like I'm making up for lost time, Tracy. <laughs> that's what's ha that's what happens, you know. You haven't done it for so long, and then all of a sudden, you just you say, "I can't stop," and that's what yeah. that's what it's about. So I and I recommend, by the way, I know there are people who think you know they're seventy, and you know, they think, okay, life is over. No. There are people who are beginning. 50 who think that or 40. It's <laughs> no, true, especially no. in the music world. Oh, I haven't gotten a job and I'm 35. I'm never going to make it, right? Like <laughs> no. there are people who think that. So this message is just so powerful, so empowering yeah. Yeah. for people to hear. Yeah. And, you know, of course, the other part of that, that I love of your story is that you're creating it on your own terms, which is yeah. what Crushing Classical is about. Right. And right. yeah, so I think it's right. just phenomenal. So right. I'm so happy right. to be able to share your story today. Oh, so, thank you. So if people, if people have ensembles and they want more to you to talk to you about playing your music, can right. they get your sheet music or can they commission or like, how does that work if that, if they want to play it? I, I get where you can listen, which I'm sure lots of people will check out, but like, how can they play it? Right. So why they can always contact me at Sharon at SharonRockman dot com. Okay. That's my email for everyone. Okay. Those and will they be can in let the me know notes. what their yeah, what their right, what their uh, particular interest is yeah. or need. And then we could talk from there because the only sheet music right now I have is for duets, but they can talk to me and we could chat further about that. Okay, uh, great. you know, because it's um you know, it's, um, it's very exciting. It's a very exciting time. That's all, you know. It sure so. is. It sure yeah. is. That's so great. Okay. <laughs> Even I'll with make, COVID. Well, I mean, it is a damper on everything, but it does give people the opportunity to spend more time on other projects, like, you know, changing up their teaching businesses or focusing on creative projects. So, right. so right. I think a lot of people are doing that. It sounds like that's what you're doing right. too. So right. That's so great. And in the show notes, I'm going to have all the information with your website, the book, oh, on how to check the book out. I know people in my audience will be very interested in the book, oh, good. Good. especially students who want to know more about the history, violin students. I think right. it's fa fascinating. Right. So, right. So, yeah. You know what, Tracy, I was going to say the last thing is that this has been a, the most productive time of my life. And the reason being that I work with a great marketing team, uh, terrific. They help me get the music out, but also it's about nothing should stand in your way. So there's all this online stuff. You can do virtual videos, yep. you know, to let people hear your music. I've been actually recording during this time. I have a local studio. They have four rooms. We take one person at a time, distance each other. Yeah. And we can record and we could do all of that. I mean, there's live streaming. There's a lot of stuff available, even though this has been in many ways a very uh, challenging time yeah. and a time where you have to be solitary. It doesn't, it shouldn't keep you from doing those things and getting your music out. Yeah. 
Well, that's great, Sharon. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you hear hearing that from you too as well. And like, sounds like you're really savvy on the technology side of things too, <laughs> which is really awesome. I'm trying. I am trying. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, awesome. Well, thank yeah. you so much for thank being you. on today. This has been thank such you. a pleasure hearing your story. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much. Good things to you.